Welcome to the Wealth in Yourself podcast, a show dedicated to helping you master the complex subject of money by simplifying it through stories and actionable advice. I'm Josh St. Laurent, and this is Wealth in Yourself. Welcome to the Wealth in Yourself podcast, where we help people to design their ideal life and take control of their time and money. I'm your host, Josh St. Laurent. Today, we're joined by Jonathan de Gouveia. Jonathan is a real estate investor currently buying three to four properties per month with the exit strategy of flipping to investors on the back end or refinancing and keeping the property for his portfolio. I've been impressed with his work for quite some time and I'm looking forward to talking about his process. Jonathan, welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks for having me, Josh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, hey, for anyone who isn't familiar with you and your work, what do you want them to know about you? About me, I don't know, I'm just kind of a regular guy and then I kind of fell into real estate. So it's just learning and just developing my skills and improving our business in any way that we can. I didn't take the traditional path in real estate like a lot of people. Maybe they go to university or school and then they have a W-2 job, standard nine to five, and then they transition into real estate. I used to work at restaurants and stuff like that. And then this is kind of, this is my way out of those types of jobs. Like, you know, the minimum wage jobs, this is my way out was real estate. So I am forever in debt to real estate, I guess. I love that. Yeah. I want to dig into the story a little bit because like I touched upon it in your intro, like you're doing things at, at scale, right? Three or four properties a month and big projects. I've seen kind of your before and after videos, you know, you're not taking on like a, you know, a small cosmetic job every time, you know, some of these are big rehabs. So maybe just starting from the beginning, like what was that first property? Like you were working in a restaurant and, and how'd you get into the first property and, and what was that like? Yeah. So it's kind of a long story. I'll try to keep it as concise as possible, but I currently live in Cleveland, Ohio. I invest here locally in Cleveland, Ohio, but I, when I first got into real estate, I was living in, in LA, Los Angeles, California, and I was working various kinds of like service based jobs, you know, at restaurants, stuff like that. The last job that I've ever had was when I was 23 and I was working, I'm 27 now. I just turned 27 a few weeks ago. I'm t- I was 23 at the time and I was working at a sweet greens. For anybody that's familiar with LA, I was working at the Sweet Greens on Sunset Boulevard in, in Silver Lake. And basically, like, I didn't have a lot of money. This is right around the time, like, a couple months before pandemic, I had, like, pretty much, like, no money. And I was just kind of getting by, I guess. And I didn't really have a, a long-term plan of what I wanted to do with life. I was just kind of just having fun and enjoying things as they come. And I read, I, I was, a, I've always been an avid reader. I dropped out of school when I was 20. I went to the University of Connecticut and my business partner, my now business partner and I, we moved cross country, dropped out of school together. We moved across country to LA. And like I said, we didn't have a plan and we were just trying to have fun and enjoy our lives and figure things out. Yeah. So basically when I was, when I was younger, I used to read a lot of books and I still read a lot. But at the time when I was 23, I was working this job and I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And for all the people, a lot of people read that book. And, and one of the things that stuck out to me a lot in that book was when he started talking about real estate and I was interested in it. So I wanted to figure out more about it. So I went to on, obviously, I went on Google and I looked that up and I saw this real estate seminar and I stumbled on the idea of wholesaling real estate. And for those that don't know what wholesaling is, it's essentially like, you know, finding a distressed property owner who wants to sell their property, getting the property under contract and then essentially selling the contract to, a, to an investor that wants to either buy the property to, to flip or to rent or whatever it is. And I thought that was cool. And it was in, in my mind, it sounds so easy. And it was like this get rich quick thing that I thought it was going to happen. And yeah, so basically I, we tried, my business partner and I, we've been roommates since, since we moved out when we were 20 and we were like, let's, let's try it. So we started doing this, this thing. And basically the first like six months was just very, very difficult. We were trying to do it like locally living in LA and it was just, it just wasn't working. You know what I mean? We were, I was personally, I didn't have a car at the time. So what I was doing was I was literally getting on a bike. I had a bike that my, my, friends let me borrow from his room like his roommate had, had a bike that he stole from like burning man and it had like a leopard print seat and all this stuff and he just gave me the bike or let me borrow the bike i should say and i would ride the bike in every single neighborhood in la just riding i'd ride like 14 miles a day on average i was like calculating the amount, of time, the amount of time i was riding right before work and i would just any property that i saw i would take a picture of the the house and i would take down the address and we were just cold call and, and, and stuff like that. And, and it just really didn't work, honestly. Like it, it, we got some appointments. We tried to get some houses under contract, but there was just, it was just very difficult. So 
I, I had member, I had met this guy at another networking event that was real estate specific and he lived in Cleveland and he was just, he was just uh, vacationing, I guess you could say in, in LA and he gave me his number and I was just periodically I'd message him and stuff. And around this time we were six months in, we hadn't closed a deal and it was just a lot of just banging our head, head against the wall. We had no idea what we were doing, obviously. We didn't have a lot of money for marketing and those kinds of things. So I called this guy up and I said, hey, like, I know you guys, you're doing some deals and like, how can I help? And he inevitably told me that we could just call some lists for him. So you'd get, you'd pay for like lists for marketing and we were just doing cold calls. And then we would, we started splitting the deals 50, 50 or no, sorry, it was 60, 40. He was 60 M, 40% us. And we were just splitting the deals and then we just worked our way up. And then right around the time when the pandemic hit, we had done enough deals where we made enough significant, a decent amount of money, I should say. And then we just decided to move to Cleveland and that's where we kind of started our journey. And after two years of doing wholesaling, we, we moved out, we just decided it wasn't for us anymore. I, we personally didn't like the sales and the marketing aspect of the business. It's a lot of follow up, a lot of marketing, stuff like that. So we decided to start doing like buy and holds. And then that's, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> that's when we started getting into the construction stuff and that's when it started getting really tough. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I definitely want to talk about that kind of next chapter, if you will. But before we move on to that, like what were some of the lessons that you learned wholesaling that you still use and apply today when you're trying to find deals? Were there good lessons there that maybe people listening could take away if they're trying to find their first deal, for example? Yeah. The wholesaling is from my perspective, it's kind of a glorified like nine to five almost. Like it's like, it's like a step up from like having like a regular job. But like you're, unless you start really scaling it, it's, you're pretty much like you own a job. And that's, that, that was something that I didn't like about it. I thought like when I, when we went into it, it was always with the idea of like, we're going to make a lot of money. And like, that's what the, my idea was, is just kind of going to get into it. It's going to be easy and you're going to make a lot of money. And it was like everything but that, you know what I mean? It was literally just like spending a lot of money on marketing, you know what I mean? Like getting lists and doing, you know, we were doing a lot of cold calling and texting at the time. And at the time that was, it was a lot easier because they didn't have all these regulations around like spam calls and spam text messages and stuff like that. And it was a lot of follow-up and we were doing all the cold calls for a while until we had some VAs and stuff like that. But at, at the first it was just us doing the calls and I didn't like getting on the call with somebody and then they're, you know, yell at you and tell you to F off or whatever it may be. And then you have to keep calling them because it's a lead and you technically paid for that lead when it came to the marketing dollars. And, you know, six months down the road, now they're interested in selling and, and then we'd get the contract. I didn't like that aspect of it, but it, it did serve a purpose. And the purpose that it served for us, at least, was that in the grand scheme of things, it really helped us learn uh, about the market because when we first started wholesaling, we didn't really know anything about Cleveland. And then we finally learned about like what areas people were buying in, what area, like investors were very, very excited about, what areas were they not excited about, you know what I mean? And we learned about like basically the price that, it, that the houses needed to be at for us to be able to make any money. So if we got it at this price, we know we had to create a whole set at this price. If somebody's willing to pay this price, when we got into our buy and hold and, and fix and flip journey, we were like, okay, well, we were getting them here and we were selling them here, but that's just because we had to pay for the marketing dollars. So we could pay for it over here and be on the other end of that instead of having to be the wholesalers and finding the deals we could find have people find the deals for us and we just pay at this price and we don't have to deal with all the back end stuff and all the follow up and stuff. So that was really the biggest lesson and it was a, a great experience because I, I think that for us we have a lot of empathy for wholesalers because we know it's like a grind and it's 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 really hard to find good deals and you gotta kinda dig through the weeds and stuff like that. So that's kind of the biggest lesson I got out of out of wholesaling journey. Now, how did mentorship play a role or did it play a role, I guess, from the guy that you met in LA who essentially, you know, helped you in your journey out to Cleveland and that was sort of his market. How did his mentorship play a role in those two years that you were wholesaling? Were you part of deals with him where you could sort of learn side by side with him? So at the beginning, before I personally moved to Cleveland, my business partner, he moved here a couple months before. I was just kind of like, we, we had done a couple of deals. We had made some more, some, like a good amount of money. And in my mind, like, I remember we had a month. It was like our first, like our first really, really good month where we made like 30 grand and, you know, we had very low overhead and stuff like that. And I had never seen that amount of money in my entire life up until that point. So I was under the impression that that's what it was going to be like all the time. You know what I mean? That was like, this is just gonna like easy. It was hard getting to that point. But then when it got to that point, it seemed like everything was going to just continue to go that way. And it was always going to be easy. So I was living in LA when my business partner came to Cleveland and he was just like, he came here to Cleveland with the intention of going back eventually, but he just wanted to feel out the market and stuff like that. And then like after like four months, he was like, yeah, I'm not coming back. And like, that's when I was like, oh, well, I guess there's really nothing for me here in LA, so I might as well move to Cleveland. 
And, but in that time he, he was going to a lot of appointments in person and stuff like that. Before we, we, when we were doing it all virtually, either the guy that was like our mentor, his name is Ricardo, either he would show up to the appointments or we would pay somebody like 50, 70 bucks just to take pictures. And then we would just negotiate with the person over the phone. So Joseph, which is my business partner, he learned a lot from Ricardo because they were just always like going to appointments together. And Ricardo was just like more experienced and he was older too. So it like, it kind of gave a little bit more credibility to that side of things. And he knew a lot more about like the construction side and material costs. So when you're talking to a seller who has a house that's extremely distressed, it's hard to, to convince them that they, that the price can't be at the, what they wanted. Sometimes it needs to be a little bit lower because of the construction costs and stuff like that. But they don't understand that because obviously if they did, they would fix it up themselves or, you know, they figure it out. So that was really one of the valuable things we learned from him. Other than that, it was mostly just trial and error. And because just like, it's hard to teach stuff when people are so far ahead of you. When someone's like a couple years ahead of you, it's hard to teach them something because the things that they would teach you are no longer applicable, right? We have a friend, for example, who owns like 700 units here um, in, in Cleveland. And he's, he's a very wealthy guy, but he was buying houses, like single family houses through three bedroom, one bath houses for like five grand, like 10, 15 years ago. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing he could teach us that would actually be like something that we could learn because it's like he was buying houses for a tenth of the price that we're buying them now. You know what I mean? Before they even need any renovation costs. So yeah, it, it was it was helpful, but to a certain extent, there's a point where I think that you, your experience is the more important than having somebody teach you things. So walk us through that first deal without Ricardo, where you guys just had to sort of figure it out on your own. It was the first deal that you did not as a wholesaler, but actually going in and doing the construction and figuring it out the deal. It was like a first Burr deal. Like for those that don't know what Burr is, it's like buy, renovate, rent and repeat, Burr, whatever. <laughs> And so, so when we bought that first house, we were still wholesaling at the time. We were still kind of like, we had generated a bunch of leads and we were kind of working the leads. And we came across this triplex that was like, it needed a lot of work, but we, we didn't really know anything about the construction stuff. We didn't really even consult anybody about it, which honestly, in hindsight, we should have had maybe Ricardo walk the house with us, but we didn't. He, we just kind of just went with it. And that was like two years ago. And that was probably one of the worst years of my life. I'm not going to lie. It was so terrible because... We just didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. And when you don't know what you're getting yourselves into, you're kind of signing up for things that you obviously, you, you don't know, you know what I mean? So we bought this triplex. I think we bought it for about like $50,000, something somewhere around that range. And we had estimated to put like 25 into it. We did it all cash because we didn't have any anybody that would be willing to lend to us because one, we didn't have anybody that we knew that we were willing to lend. And two, any hard money lender, they normally don't lend to people that haven't done some deals. And which is kind of like, it doesn't really make sense. It, you know what I mean? It's like for the people that go to school, you can't get a job because you don't have, because you don't have experience, but you can't get experience because you don't get a job. Like that's kind of what the hard money lending space is like. So we had to do a cash. So we bought the house cash and this is like all the money that we had, literally all the money that we had built up until that point. And we had just intended on fixing it ourselves. And we, we were way in over our heads, like way in over our heads. We were just fixing up everything as we, as we went, you know, we did some drywall, we did some flooring, some paint, that stuff was kind of easy. And then we finished two units. It was out of the three units. We finished them completely. And then we found out that there was like plumbing leaks and this, that, and the other. So then we had to remove the drywall and then fix the plumbing. And then we hired a contractor to do the plumbing because we weren't confident in doing the plumbing. And then he like ripped us off because we didn't know what we were doing. And then he just stopped showing up. I paid him with the credit card. This is a, a tip for anybody that's paying contractors. If possible, I would say pay them with a the credit card. That way, so you could just do a chargeback if they if they don't do good work. And it takes a little while. It took like two months to get the money back or some of the money back. But we got some of the money back. And yeah, he just, just stopped showing up. And, and But that was one of the best things that ever happened to us because we learned how to screen people. We learned how to become a little bit better with the contractors. And funny enough, all that time that was lost in that in finishing that project, that first one, it led us up to the moment where we met the contractor that is now working with us today and he's worked with us since. And if it hadn't been for making all those mistakes and it hadn't been for buying that house and, and essentially making that mistake, then we wouldn't have met our current contractor who has led us up into this point. And so, so it was a blessing in disguise. The last thing I'll really say about the house is when we were finally finished with it, after all the headaches and stuff like that, we ended up refinancing out of the house to get our original money back, original investment back. And we ended up losing a lot of money because we didn't know a lot of things. Like, again, we didn't know about origination fees. We didn't know about the like, appraisal value that much. And we ended up tearing a garage in the back. We tore it down and then that destroyed our appraisal value. It took like I think ten or twelve thousand dollars off the appraisal value, and then with the originations, it came the origination fees on the back end when we got the loan came out to like around ten grand, 
So that was pretty much it. So, you know what I mean? So the appraisal value came in lower than we expected. And then, you know, with the originations, it really ate into our thing. So we ended up losing, I want to make clear, we didn't technically lose any money. That's the money we left in the property. It's better to look at it like a down payment, but our intention was to have no money left in the deal to bear it successfully. It's leaving zero money in the deal or making a little bit of money. But after that house, all the lessons from that house transferred to another house that we ended up, that we bought as well. Around the same time we bought this one, we weren't able to fix it because we didn't have money. So we took all the lessons into the next one and that next house house, we felt like we were forced to flip it. So we flipped it and when we flipped it. We made like 37 grand. And that was kind of like, oh, like we could do that. We could do this. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, okay, like if the numbers don't work out for a bird, we could just flip it. That's kind of when our, our brain started to turn on. And that's when we started like the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. Yeah. I love the journey. Like I like the attitude of like, Hey, that was the best thing that could have happened to us. So, I mean, now fast forward, you're doing three, four properties a month. You have a good contractor, a good team. You understand the deals a bit better. What were some of those lessons along the way? So if someone's listening and maybe they're earlier on in their journey and they're like, well, what were some of these lessons? So I can save myself that pain and frustration. Like what were some of the questions maybe that you used to narrow down a good contractor who wasn't going to rip you off? You know, how do you identify some of these good deals? Like what were some of those lessons to go from, you know, this one property where you sort of broke even on the deal to now doing three to four a month. So the challenge is like, obviously you got to find good deals and good deals is, is a little bit subjective, I guess, depending on the person. A good deal for us is something that needs a significant amount of work. You know what I mean? Like, because that's what works for our business model. Our business model is finding a house that needs the most amount of work possible, but it has to be at a price that works, obviously, right? The reason why we like doing it like that is there's multiple reasons. The, one of the biggest reasons is is time. We have a lot of contractors that work for us. We have one guy who's his he's general contract, but he has 16 guys that work underneath him. And our goal is to keep him as busy as humanly possible. So the way that we do that is we got to take on the heavier projects so that it gives us time to find more deals. Because if I get a contract for a house today, we're not going to close on it for call it 21 to 30 days on average, right? That's usually the amount of time that we give ourselves to be able to close on deals so we don't have any like cash flow issues within our business. So taking on those bigger projects allows us to buy ourselves some little bit more time so that we could find more deals. That's our business model. The other reason why we like buying the houses that are very, that needs a lot of renovations is because we spend more money at Home Depot and it helps us get to a point where we could start getting like the higher discounts at the Home Depot. Because what a lot of people don't talk about is once you don't start getting like significant discounts at Home Depot until you pass the half million dollars a year threshold. You know what I mean? You'll start getting a, some, some decent discounts after a quarter million a year. You'll start getting better treatment and you'll start becoming a more reputable buyer in the eyes of a Home Depot, especially if you're going to the same store all the time once you get past half a million dollars. So our goal is if we could buy houses that need 10 to 15 grand in materials for every single house and we're doing four a month, then we're spending close to 60 grand a month. And over the course of a year, that's, that's going to be over half a million dollars. That was our intention. That's our goal. That's how we looked at it. That's kind of, it's baked into our, our business model. But as far as the things for the construction side of things, I'm not an expert in construction. In that first house that we bought, we ended up having to do a lot of the work ourselves because we didn't have a lot of money. We ended up rewiring two of the units ourselves, you know, like complete rewire, redo all the plumbing work that the guy didn't do well. That was kind of a pain. We had obviously did all the drywall work ourselves and the paint and the cabinets and those kinds of things. But just knowing the basics of how things function is going to be important because a lot of people, they don't know how water gets from their water water meter to their sink. You know what I mean? Like they don't understand that. And when you're going to buy a house, it puts you at a disadvantage because when we walk a house, we already immediately know like for our specific business model, like we're replacing the plumbing every single time and we're more than likely going to do a lot of electrical work. So our minds are already fixated. I guess when we're walking a house, like today we walk two houses. The first thing we do is when we, when we look at a house that we're going to be planning on making an offer on is, you know, is the foundation good? Let's look at the electrical panels. And, and that's pretty much it. Like those are the most important things. And obviously the side, and, and the roof and stuff like that. But that stuff is very easy to identify. Yeah, basically having a basic understanding of construction is really, really important. I would say focusing on, on plumbing and electrical is almost essential. And a lot of this stuff isn't rocket science. So that's the key right there is when you start to know enough of it, it makes it easy to have a conversation with someone to know whether or not they know what they're talking about because it's not that complicated. You know what I mean? It's really not that complicated. Again, I'm not an expert or anything, but I know like when we do duplexes, like on average, the material spent for a, a duplex on plumbing for both the plumbing drains and the water supply lines, it's like 1500 bucks to $2,000. That's the average spend. So I know that like, let's say I needed a plumber and they're going to give me a quote on, on, the, on the plumbing. If they told me that the quote's going to be, let's say $10,000, 
then I know they're trying to make like eight. You know what I mean? So now you could kind of like, you're putting yourself in a position where you know enough to basically know that the person is either trying to rip you off or they're not very professional, you know? So that's that's kind of my whole thing. And we don't have to deal with that as much because we have the same contracts to work on all of our projects. So the prices are almost always the same depending on this, the work needs to be done, but it's all baked in. So now it's pretty much streamlined. So we always replace the plumbing. We almost, we always estimate for, you know, furnaces, water tanks, and that's kind of stuff. It, we sometimes replace the roof if it needs a lot of work. It doesn't, and that's pretty much it. Cabinets, countertops, new bathrooms every single time. That stuff's so, like pretty standard for us. We do all this stuff every single time. Now, did this knowledge come from walking properties with the GC or just doing a few properties where you were getting multiple quotes? And then over time you started to realize, you know, hey, 10K is an outrageous offer here. You know, I know what the materials cost because I've done this a couple of times. Or how did that come to be? Was it, you know, kind of partnering with the GCs and learning that knowledge from them? Or was it just experience over time? Most of it was experience over time. Our contractor is great. He walks almost all, of, I would say like about 80% of the houses. If he's not busy, he will walk the houses with us before we even make an offer on it. He will tell me what his quote is for the for labor. And he knows how we want things because we've done, I don't know, well over 30 houses already this year that are exactly like pretty much cookie cutter. So he tells us what the labor costs are going to be. And I have a spreadsheet that I have developed over the last real two years of like all the common materials that we use, the price, the amount that we're used on average. And it's pretty streamlined. You just press a couple buttons and type a couple numbers in, and then it just spits out the renovation costs. So that has been honestly that the spreadsheet that, that I have built over the last two years has been like huge game changer because it's really, really accurate, but it took time for it to become accurate because every, every single project that we would do. Let's say I would estimate for, for simplicity's sake, let's say where I'm estimating for paint for a two bedroom, one bath unit. It's about 15 gallons per unit. That's kind of where we're at with the wall paint. And then you got another 10 for the ceiling and another 10 for the trim. So that's kind of where we're at. That's like our average. Sometimes it's a little less, sometimes a little bit more, depending on the, the conditions of the drywall and those kinds of things. Right. So over time, that's, that's what I've developed because I look at all the data, you know, when you use a Home Depot Pro account, I pulled the CSV files after every single project. And then I measure the actual again, Against the estimate. And I'm like, okay, well, I thought it was this, but it really was this. And, and now you have a discrepancy or if you're overestimating now, you know, you could kind of cut back a little bit. If you're underestimating now, you know, you got to add a little bit more. And then over time it becomes more and more accurate. And that way, so when you walk a house, you have a very, very clear idea of like what you're going to be putting into it. You know, so now when we walk a house, there's a book by Ron Legrand for anybody that's a real estate investor. And, and in the book, you'd say that all the houses that you do are either going to be 25 grand, 30 grand or 40 grand in renovation costs. That's what he said in the book. For us, it's 30 grand, 50 grand or 60 grand. That's what that, <laughs> those are the numbers for us. So when we walk a house, that's how we think about it. It's like, this is going to be 30 grand, 50 grand, it's going to be 60 grand. You know what I mean? And if we get into the four units, like because we do between one and four units, we get into the four units now. That one's, uh, we've only done a few four units. So that one's kind of a little bit more blurred. The single families all the way to the duplexes and the triplexes, it's, it's between 30 and 60 grand and the renovations. And it's pretty standard. It was really experience that really got us to that point. And just checking every single house we just you know looking at the data and seeing how much should we spend and then revising and trying to cut costs where we can and that's that's kind of where, where what we do it seems to me like an advantage that you have is the consistency where you've narrowed in to not just Cleveland, but it sounds like specific neighborhoods. The houses have a lot of similarities. You're working with the same contractor, going to the same Home Depot. Like that to me seems like an advantage where things become more predictable, right? You're like, well, I did a duplex like this a week ago. I can really accurately estimate the cost. I'm going to work with the same exact contractor as before. Because I've talked to a lot of real estate investors who try to do things all over the country because more difficult. Why, well, you know, I need to build a whole new team in this place. The prices of things are different. I'm not familiar with the neighborhood. So it seems to me like it's an advantage the way that you're doing things in the similar area. Was that by design? Was that sort of like the path your mentor led you down? Or how did you end up, you know, in specific neighborhoods in Cleveland doing duplexes and triplexes? The reason why we do things the way we do things is at first it was kind of just like, let's just find a good deal. And back to our wholesaling background is we knew what areas were like good areas and the reasons why they were considered quote unquote good areas to like be investing in. And, you know, we live in one part of town where we wanted to kind of make it so that we could buy more deals in the areas that are, that are close to where we live to make things really, really easy. You know what I mean? And over time, you know, at the beginning, it was just like we would just get deal. We would take deals wherever we could that were in neighborhoods that we knew were decent neighborhoods and we would just make it work. Now it's like we have so much deal flow and we have developed a credibility within the market with 
you know, wholesalers and realtors and people and stuff like that, where now we target specific neighborhoods because they're, you know, centrally located. They're really close to our other deals that we're doing. We know the prices really well of the, of the houses and they're really close to the Home Depot. So right now, most of the deals we're working on are within a five mile radius of where we live. And they're all like within like a two mile radius of each other, three mile radius of each other. And they're super close to Home Depot, like 10 minute drive to Home Depot. So we go to the same Home Depot and it's just so easy because they get that contractor can go make 10 trips to Home Depot in a day. And it and it's not as much of a bottleneck as going to a specific part of town it's on like the east side of Cleveland. There's like no highway access to this one part of Cleveland. And so you have to take like back roads and stuff. And it takes like 30 to 45 minutes, depending on like traffic, if there's any traffic to get to a Home Depot, you know what I mean? And it's like, you can't realistically be buying multiple houses in a neighborhood like that because you're never going to get anything done. You know what I mean? So at the beginning, it was just whatever we could get. And now it's we're at a point where we have enough going for us and establish ourselves enough where we will target those areas. And, and what that really means for us is that we just let everybody know like, hey, we buy in these areas and this is what we're doing. And, and everybody just kind of wants to send us deals because they know we close. They know we know the prices. And it really helps a lot because when we're in these neighborhoods, we will find deals just by being in the neighborhoods. You know what I mean? Like when we're working on properties, somebody across the street, oh, I know this person down the street that wants to sell their house. They're more likely to sell to somebody like us because we're fixing up a house on that street and they could come and look at the house and those kind of things. So it really builds a lot of credibility and it helps us a lot to do things in specific neighborhoods because we're known for doing deals in those neighborhoods. And over the long term, that's the biggest benefit to us because when all these properties property values appreciate and we own a significant portion of a neighborhood that only benefits us more. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up sort of like a longer term vision. I wanted to segue there, but it seems like you guys have really built an awesome system and process for yourself in kind of a small area so that you can just duplicate it at scale, which is really cool to see. What is the longer term vision for you guys? You know, let's say in 2024, you know, do you have any big plans or is it just keep chugging along, kind of doing what you're doing since it's working so well? 2024, our goal is to can pretty much continue doing what we're doing. We don't want to scale too quickly. We're at a pace or at a level that's very, it's hard to to get to this point, I guess you could say in some ways, at least locally here from the people that we know, we are at like pretty much the, the top of the food chain as far as most real estate investors here locally. There are obviously bigger players than us, but from the people that we know within our network, like we're kind of at that, at that stage where we're doing a lot of deals and to go beyond that, it's difficult. We're at a point where it's, you're at a level where it's hard to to get to that point and it's even harder to get to like to double that and right now we were focusing on efficiency we're focusing on narrowing down like the things that need to, to we need to do we're focused on you know maximizing our profitability we're focused on making sure that we are being strategic about our our, our finances too not spreading ourselves too thin not doing too much you know what i mean but Ideally, we would like for the new year to to get into bigger multifamily deals so that we could do one deal or two deals and it's the same as doing 10. You know what I mean? Instead of doing like 10 single family houses, we could do one building. It's a 10, it's 10 unit. It's a little bit less effort. It's a little bit harder with the city, obviously, with the permitting and the and the inspections and those kinds of things. But overall, it would be a little bit less, a, a less of a headache because it would be at one location and we not have to go and do it in 10 different houses and, and pulling draws from different places and stuff like that and getting loans in a bunch of different houses and then having to refinance at a separate places. Like that's that's kind of our thing. So we do want to maximize efficiency. I think that's that's top of our list of things to do is just maximize efficiency and just really just keep doing what we're doing before we start trying to scale it a little further. Makes a ton of sense. Well, hats off to you for what you've built. I mean, I think it's really amazing how you're scaling and also so targeted in the area that you are. I want to segue to three questions I try to ask towards the end of every show, more personal to you, really. And so the very first question is, what does living a wealthy life look like for you? Living a wealthy life for me is honestly just being able to being able to say no to things is really important. That's number one. But also just being able to like have more freedom of my time to be able to do more of things that I like. At this stage that we're at, there is a lot of things that I do that I don't want to be doing. It's not that I don't, I like what I do. I like the business. I, I really enjoy real estate and stuff like that. But there's a lot of things that I do within the business that I don't like doing. And, you know, my goal is to be able to remove myself from those positions and hire those things out to people 
So that's what, what a wealthy life looks like to me is being able to have the financial means to be able to allocate tasks to people and things that you don't want to be doing because you feel like it's not your strength or you feel like it's not something that you want to spend your time on. And then you could focus on things that are more important to you. You know, for me, it's like I want to be able to read my books. And, you know, I've been I've been doing a lot of woodworking stuff lately in my free time. I just the building like furniture and stuff like that for my friends and myself and my, my girlfriend and stuff. So I want to be able to do more of the things that I like to do and focus on the things that I, I like to do within the business as well, not just on the personal side to focus on things that I really like to do within the business. Yeah, I love that. I love that answer. Just being able to spend your time in a way that pleases you, right? Do exactly. what you choose to do. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So if you could give one message to someone working to gain financial freedom who isn't there yet, what would it be? I guess this question is directed towards towards myself a little bit because I still like I'm still climbing, so I'm still so we're still learning. But my thing is, you know, when it comes to financial freedom, I think the biggest thing is knowing how how you're building a business and how that is directly correlated to your personal finances. A lot of the stuff that we're doing is we're reinvesting a lot of that money, which you know, reinvesting a lot of the money that from our from our business, which means that we're not taking as much money out of the business for ourselves. You know what I mean? Over the long term, that's a really great play. You know what I mean? Obviously, that 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 means a lot of amazing things are going to happen for us in the future. But in the short term, it's, it's just making a lot of sacrifices that, you know, you hope that will play out and pan out for you in the, in the best way possible in the future. So my thing is making sacrifices is important. And two, setting up your business in a way that benefits you the most. You know what I mean? So one of the things that we do, the reason why we like spending a lot of money on Home Depot, and this is a little bit of hack. I don't know if, the, if this is this applies to a lot of other places, but here locally, we have grocery stores that they sell Home Depot gift cards at the grocery stores. We built a business around spending a lot of money on Home Depot because the more money we spend on Home Depot, the more gift cards we get buy. And the more gift cards we get buy, we start getting free groceries and free gas. And like building a business around your lifestyle is the most important thing because that's how you get more of that freedom and be able to have more financial freedom in that way because you because you're building a business that suits you and you don't need to go and spend money on things that necessarily don't need to spend money on you know so that's kind of how I see it and I Again, also being able to build, build a business that makes sense. You know, a lot of people think when it comes to real estate, they think, okay, you buy a house, you fix it up and you flip it and you're good. And now you made a bunch of money. But for the people, the people that make a lot of money in real estate are people that are either own a lot of properties or are flipping a ton or they, they flip very little amount of houses. There's people that, that flip, you know, three, four, five houses a month that make more money than us, like on a personal side, right? But we're building a business and our, because our, our long term strategy is to hold as many properties as possible. So a lot of the profits are being rolled into other to houses that we're planning on keeping the houses that we flip, the profits are being rolled into the house we keep. So for somebody, you know, you really got to dial in like what what is it that you want? There's some people that flip three, four, five houses and they make a lot of money and it's a lot less stress on their plate as opposed to people like ourselves where it's like, yeah, we're, we're buying three, four, five houses a month. But at what cost? You know what I mean? We I love doing this and we love doing this. But the person that's making that's doing three to four or five houses in a year, they might be making more money on the personal side than we are, but our long-term success is going to be a lot bigger than theirs. You know what I mean? So it's so it just depends on what your goals are. And, and there's a lot of people that they don't have very ironed out goals. So they'll just get into something and then they create a job for themselves. And then now they're kind of like consumed by work and they don't see way out of it. So we have to have a long-term vision of owning as many properties as we can and being able to create a lot of cash flow. And that's more important than the short-term gains of taking all the profits from our flips. That long-term vision is so, so important. And I like the other point too of you're going to have to sacrifice. I think a lot of people get into real estate or just business in general, not realizing how much of a sacrifice it might be. So I love that answer. The third and final question I think is really applicable after hearing your story. The question is basically, if you only had $1,000 and you were starting over, what would be the first thing you would do with that money? That's a tough one. If I had $1,000, that's tough, man. Can't really do much of a $1,000. <laughs> With inflation, I would try my best to to network and meet as many people as I can. I think that that would help a lot. Go to networking events, I'd meet as many people as I can. And then I would try to find a way to be useful to someone that has something that I don't. Like, for example, when we when we started with the wholesaling stuff, we didn't have, we didn't even have a $1,000 to spend. You know what I mean? So the way that we started was we were being, we were useful to someone. You know what I mean? 
Ricardo, he had done a, had a good amount of deals, but he had a he had a job. He was an engineer, so he his time was limited. So for him, the thousand dollars that he would spend, or fifteen hundred bucks a month, he would spend on the marketing for the list and stuff like that was that, that didn't equal the amount of value that we were we were giving him. We we were giving him more value than the thousand dollars he was spending a month, or fifteen hundred bucks he was spending a month on marketing lists. So that's what I would do. I was just I would just pretty much do what I already did. It was just find somebody that you could help and be of of use and value to them. If that meant doing something that you're not good at well you know figure that out you know learn how to get good at that thing and then be a value to that person because that if you even if you have a thousand bucks or you don't have a thousand dollars you'll be able to make a little bit of money and then you could turn that into more money and more money more money and you're developing a skill along the way which is something you could always monetize or you know will lead you into other higher paying skills you know what i mean you might start at you know and like our journey wholesaling and then we made a good amount of money doing that but we were like okay well we could flip houses and there's more opportunities there and so that's that small skill of just being able to talk to people and being good at you know, conversing and stuff like that turned into something that I, I couldn't have never imagined like, you know, four years ago. Yeah, spot on. That's such a good answer. I'm just going to leave it right at that. For someone listening who wants to connect with you, where is the best place to track you down? I think the best place is LinkedIn. I, I've been posting a lot on LinkedIn. Jonathan Degovea on LinkedIn, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-D-E-G-O-U-V-E-I-A. I've been posting a lot on LinkedIn. I, I, I do post, I try my best to post things that are relevant and also very helpful to people. I, I think that there is a lot of, when it comes to real estate, I think it, it's not rocket science. I don't, I don't think it's, it's really that complicated, but there are a lot of nuances to the business that aren't really talked about much. And if you don't know those nuances, or at least you're not exposing yourself to wanting to learn about those nuances, I think that you can make a lot of mistakes and those mistakes cost cost a lot of money, you know, at the end of the day. And and the last thing you want is for, you know, to lose money that you can't afford to lose. When we lost money in our first deal, you know, fortunately we had money to lose. We were in a decent position when we got out of that. But there are a lot of people that get into real estate and they don't have a lot of money to lose. And if they make a big mistake, which seems like small mistake at the beginning, it turns into a big mistake and they might not be able to come back from it. So I do post a lot on LinkedIn. I, I really just like posting things that are very useful to people and hopefully a lot of people get a lot of value out of it. Yeah, I love I love what you share on LinkedIn. I actually think that's how you and I connected was me just following, you know, your videos and your journey and all the different flips that you've been doing. So I'll put the link in the show notes for anyone listening. If they want to go connect with you there, I definitely encourage them to do that. And with that, this has been the Wealth in Yourself podcast, where we help people to design their ideal life and take control of their time and money. Our guest today was Jonathan de Gouveia. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. The Wealth in Yourself podcast is hosted by me, Josh St. Laurent, and edited and produced by Ray Haycraft. To learn more about how to make your money work for you, visit us at www.wealthinyourself.com and connect with us on all social media at Wealth in Yourself. This podcast is educational in nature and is not meant to be investment advice. Please do not construe anything said to be advice and the opinions of the guests may or may not represent the opinions of Wealth in Yourself. This podcast and the information presented are separate from my employment at Golden Gate University. Still, they are part of my mission to make no cost financial knowledge more accessible. If you like the show, please take a moment to leave us a review. We read all of your feedback and we wanna make sure we cover the topics that matter most. If you have a specific subject you'd like us to explore or a guest you'd love to hear interviewed, don't hesitate to shoot us a direct message. And as always, thanks for listening.